I'm Lars Svensson, Chairman of the Heart and Vascular Institute, and uh, I trained first as a cardiologist uh, with Dr. Uh, and Professor Barlow, and then became a cardiac surgeon. And I've uh, been intimately involved with the partner trial and the executive committee, and chaired for a number of years the publication office for the partner trial. And with me today is Samir Kapadia. Samir, if you could introduce yourself. Uh, I'm the director of the cath lab and head of the interventional section here at Cleveland Clinic and uh, it is my passion also to work with the cardiac valves and have been involved in the partner trial and the valvular interventions for uh, more than 15 years. So this is uh, an exciting time for all of us to be here and uh, we will discuss the new advances in the aortic valve uh, partner trials. So, as many of you know, uh, dating back to 2001, when Alain Crebier did the first uh, uh, transcatheter valve insertion, there have been a lot of advances. Um, I was uh, involved back in 2004 because at uh, the time there had been the three hospital centers here in the United States, including the Cleveland Clinic, where we hadn't had much success with the Krebier technique, which was a transfemoral venous approach to putting in a percutaneous valve. And so at that time, uh, I was working with uh, the Edwards company on the transapical approach. And so we did a whole lot of studies in animals uh, on establishing that approach, and then later, there was the great success of uh, uh, John Webb and Vancouver developing a transfemoral uh, artery approach. The question from FDA then was, um, uh, were these procedures effective? And so that resulted in a number of trials which uh, Edwards uh, supported, and I'm talking particularly about the partner trials. Medtronic had ran a similar program. So the first major trial was the PARTNER-1 trials where we compared uh, the percutaneous valves against uh, medical, best medical treatment, which was highly effective. Then PARTNER-1, uh, the other arm was the high-risk patients where we compared the patients who uh, either had a surgical procedure, a lot of them invasively, versus uh, the transcatheter device, and that showed equivalence. Then came partner two, which was once again a comparison between uh, uh, TAVA, as we came to call it, initially we called it TAVI, but after meeting uh, with CMS, I went down a couple of trips to CMS, and they said, why are you calling it TAVI? Aren't you, you know, from a reimbursement point of view, it should be replacement, and so that's how we changed the name to TAVA. And uh, so the, the second trial was, again, comparing uh, surgery versus uh, TAVA in an intermediate risk group of patients and essentially uh, equivalent results. And then the third trial was PARTNER-3, which was a low-risk trial. And so I'm going to ask Samir to talk a bit about this. I, I was involved in some of the early planning on this on the executive committee. So Samir, you'd like to talk about that and then the subsequent trials. Right. So the PARTNER-3 trial was one of the most recent trials that was recently published in New England Journal. And the idea of the trial was to take low-risk patients, again, patients who have not bicuspid, but tricuspid aortic valve and aortic valve stenosis with an STS score of less than four, meaning that they are low risk for aortic valve surgery. And these patients underwent randomization either to TAVR or SAVR. And when you look at the data, the primary endpoint of the trial was rehospitalization, death, and uh, death from any cause, and stroke of any kind. And the primary endpoint was superior for TAVR compared to SAVR, and this was a one-year endpoint. So this was the main finding of the trial. However, it's very important to recognize that even when you compare the death and stroke, that was also low in both arms. So if you look at the 30-day or one-year death or stroke, 
in Saver or Tower, both this risk was extremely low and it was somewhat in favor of Tower. The long-term data are still not available because this is a relatively recent trial and we have one-year outcome data from this particular trial. Uh, these were the main findings and interestingly enough, the paravalular leak or pacemaker rate were equal. The hemodynamics compared to the prior studies, when we looked at the prior studies, when we put the tower valve, the tower valve was larger by 0.1 millimeter in the tower versus saver. And in this particular study, it was the opposite. The surgical valves were 1.8 centimeter square compared to 1.7 in the tower. So this is a groundbreaking trial in the sense that now we are able to offer tower in appropriate patients. And this is the very important part, that appropriate patient uh, who are also considered low risk. And this is the new advancement in this particular field where we want to know if you are a low risk patient, how would you determine whether you would have surgery or whether you would have uh, tower? What do you think, Dr. Svensson? How, how should people approach this particular uh, so set of I, I think if one reads through the full New England Journal of Medicine article and the supplements, there are some important points here. Uh, the one was that the one endpoint was readmission uh, after the procedure, so either the transfemorals, so these are all transfemorals, uh, versus uh, open AVR. And I always thought that that was a bit unfair against surgery, because if you look at one year, uh, essentially the results are, are very similar from the point of view of uh, functional capacity. And in fact, if you look at New York Heart Association, they were slightly better, not significantly so, in the open AVR. Then secondly, if you look at the mortality rates, there was no significant difference in mortality rates. And as Samir said, the um, orifice area and the gradients were lower in the patients who had an open AVR. And, and the big difference was that in partner three, we weren't restricted as to the valve we could use. So in other words, in the previous studies, we had to use an Edwards valve, and we were also allowed to do root enlargements. The other point about uh, the partner three trial is that um, one quarter of the patients in the surgical arm had other procedures, including coronary artery bypass as a major uh, group in that quarter. So it's not quite a comparison between TAVR, transfemoral, and open AVR. It's open AVR and a lot of the patients also having a, uh, another procedure and typically coronary artery bypass. So that sort of must be thought of in the mix here. The, the other thing is if you look at the data, there's a catch up in the TAVR patients as far as uh, stroke and mortality. What's that they're going to play out as? We don't know. But I suspect that over time these tr uh, survival stroke rates and reintervention rates will probably be pretty parallel and they may cross or uh, go either direction and recross each other over time. So uh, we also have to be cautious because this trial is not over. The final endpoint is 10 years. Now I realize a lot of patients will want to make a decision quickly, but they need to be a bit careful, um, particularly if they're younger as far as the long-term prognosis, because we don't know what it's going to be like. But at least at this stage, as far as early results, either procedure is pretty reasonable. So Samir, let's take the new trials also that are going to be coming out, not as major, but the unload trial, which is for heart failure patients, which I think is uh, from the point of view, view of treating heart failure patients, which we kind of neglected in the TAVR trials, I think is going to be very important. And then also the early low, TAVR. early TAVR, the low risk um, or pre-symptomatic treatment of aortic valve stenosis. So both of these are going to be very important. And early TAVR is the idea that what is the right time to treat the patients with aortic stenosis before the symptoms happen. If they have severe aortic stenosis, you can prevent LV hypertrophy and maybe have better outcomes long term. And unload LV is a trial 
where if you have heart failure and the aortic stenosis is not severe, if you treat the aortic stenosis, maybe you can improve the outcomes. Again, both of them are very key trials uh, to pathophysiology of aortic stenosis. So again, we will learn as time goes that what will pan out from these trials. Yeah, I think they're very important because obviously in the heart failure population, this is something that I think is going to be very good for our patients potentially, and I expect that the results are going to be very good. I think in the patients who are asymptomatic, we'll learn a lot more, and I hope that we'll be able to select the patients who are going to be treated earlier. Now, just to go back to the surgical side, uh, here at the Cleveland Clinic, um, for the last seven years, our mortality rate for open AVRs, mostly done as isolated, mininvasive um, operations, the mortality rate has been 0.5%. And indeed, last year, we did not have a death related to a uh, isolated AVR. Having said that, if you look at our results from TAVR, they've been superb too. And, and the team has done a wonderful job in treating TAVR patients. And our mortality rate's been running in the 0.2, 0.4% for the last few years for TAVR also. So at least at the Cleveland Clinic, we've got equipoise. We know we've got uh, well, both procedures are excellent for our patients. We also see now a lot more complex patients where other institutions have turned the patients down for TAVA and obviously for many years turned down for open AVR and we have a solution for those patients. And in fact, if you look at our patients, so we do about 3,000 um, valve operations a year and for the over 2,000 patients who have aortic valve procedures, um, majority of those are patients having complex multi-valve procedures, plus or minus cabbages and redos. So we have a, a lot of other things to offer patients. So thanks very much. Uh, no, Samuel. I think it's an exciting time and uh, people have more options. And this is the first time that, uh, you know, the whole uh, cardiology and cardiac surgery teams works together and provide all different options to the patient. So uh, it, is a, it is a pleasure to be involved in such a great time in valve operations. It's an exciting time. Exciting time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your attention.